You know, growing up, my family faced a lot of challenges in life. There were times when we didn't have food on the table, where we didn't have a vehicle, we couldn't barely make ends meet. But I'm very thankful for that time because it taught me the value of family, that even if we didn't have a lot of nice things, we always had each other no matter what. Now, during that time especially, my mom was very intentional to tell me and to make sure that we as a family, we would not miss church. No matter what happened, there were times when we didn't have transportation, we couldn't even get to church, but we found found a way, we made a way, and there wasn't going to be a reason that was good enough for us to miss church, and so we really placed a value on going to church, and I'm so thankful for that. Why? Because even though my family left certain gaps in my life that they just couldn't fill because we were kind of dysfunctional, but my church, my youth group, I had brothers and sisters there that helped fill those gaps in my life. Now, a couple of those people are my good friends, my brothers, I consider Adam and JR. Now, I've got a picture I want to share with you. The first one is of me, Adam, and our youth pastor, Rick. Now, back in this time was when the front tuck first came out, and we were all taking a picture here, posing, doing the front tuck, just trying to be funny. Um, that was at a Mission Fuge youth camp that we went to. The second picture is a little bit even more OG, okay? Now, that top picture there that you're going to see on the screen is a picture of me wearing a shirt that says, Satan is a nerd, and my brother, Adam, we were learning how to play the guitar. We were helping run a summer camp at the time, um, and the one below that is me and my buddy, JR. Now, now, JR and I in that picture are holding a broken smoke detector. You can't really see it in there. It's kind of hard to tell. But let me explain to you what happened with that broken de smoke detector. So we were in, we we're at youth camp. We're staying in these college dorms, and there's this really long hallway. Now, what do you do when you have a really long hallway? You throw a Frisbee, right? That's what you do. That's what you always do, right? I mean, that's what we always did. And so we're standing in this long hallway. We're throwing the Frisbee. We're just kind of chilling. And we decided to invent a game. Now, that is a lost art. I don't know about you, but if you haven't never invented a game before, you're missing out. I want you to pause this video right now, go get some friends, go outside and invent a game. Okay, maybe don't pause the video, but you know, afterwards, invent a game. It's awesome. So we had this idea, let's invent this game. You stand in this room, I'll stand down like three or four doors, and I'll stand in this room on the same side of the hallway. The object of the game was to throw the Frisbee out of your room into the hallway and loop it to where it would land in your opponent's doorway, in their room. And so we were going through this. We were trying this. We probably played this game for over an hour. I think we ended up only getting like one or two points each because it was super hard. But this one time, the last time we did it, I remember one of us, I don't remember who did it, but we threw the Frisbee out into the hallway, and the next thing you know, it hits the smoke detector, breaks it into like three or four pieces, and it hits the ground. But it was like this movie where, you know, you hear something crash behind you, and you turn around, and you look back and nothing was there because the moment that thing hit the ground, JR came out of nowhere. He slung and picked all those pieces up and just dove into a bedroom because he didn't want anybody else to see and find out that we had broken something. So we get in this bedroom. We start to try and fix this thing. I've never taken a smoke detector apart. I don't know if you have, but we tried to take this thing and put it back together. And the next thing you know, it starts hissing and smoking. It's like, and I like throw the thing. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought it was about to catch on fire. And there would have been no smoke detector to like say there was a fire. But, you know, anyways, it didn't catch on fire, thankfully. But we did end up posing for a picture and laughing about it all these years later. And the whole point is, is that even though, um, you know, Adam and JR, we don't live by each other anymore. You know, we live kind of far apart, but we still talk each and every day. We're in a group text. We send each other funny memes and different things, but we are constantly checking on one another, and we're constantly there for one another. Those guys have been my brothers in the difficult times of my life, and in the great times, they've celebrated with me, and they've cried with me, um, and they have been those two people who have filled gaps in my life left by my family that my family couldn't fill. Now, here at The Social, we've been talking a lot about over the past few weeks about family. We've been going through this series called Family Matters. And for some of you, you've maybe looking at everybody else's family, you've gotten some time to reflect, and you're like, well, man, you know, my parents are divorced, and, you know, we don't have this nice house, and we live in an apartment, and we don't go to this fancy school. I just got this, and I don't have the new Jordans, and I don't have the new Vans, and I don't have all these things. And we find ourselves maybe comparing and wishing we had somebody else's family. But the truth is, let me let you in on a little secret, okay? No family is perfect. None whatsoever. At some point in your life, your family is going to let you down. That's just the truth of the matter. And at some point, and even whoever you consider to have the best family, even in their lives, at some point, their family is going to let them down. Now, that's the bad news, but the good news is that God wants to 
and can give you more family. God wants to and can give you more family. So let's look about in the Bible about a passage of scripture of what this kind of looks like tangibly in somebody's life. We got two guys here we're going to talk about, David and Jonathan, okay? Now this picks up, we're going to pick up the story in 1 Samuel, but what happens is, and I want to give you a little bit of background about their families. They both come from dysfunctional families, okay? Now David, what do we know about him? David was going to be anointed as the next king, but his family didn't know that. So this prophet walks up into the house of Jesse, David's dad, and he's like, hey, God sent me here to anoint one of your children, your sons, to be the next king. So go get all of your sons and bring them here, and I'm going to tell you which one, because God's going to tell me which one of your sons that is the next king. So Jesse brings all of his sons except David. He doesn't think David, his last son, his youngest son, is even worth it. So he leaves him out in the field to tend to the sheep. That's how much his dad thought of him. Now, when it comes to Jonathan, his mom seemed very passive and just really involved, not un- very uninvolved in his life, but his dad was the complete opposite. King Saul was aggressive, was overly involved, was almost smothering. Can anybody relate? But he was almost smothering in different ways. And his dad was so power hungry. All he wanted was more power and more control. And so in in keeping with that, though, um, he even tried to kill David on multiple occasions. Talk about families that are both dysfunctional. But what the crazy part about this is, is for some strange reason, these two guys ended up becoming friends. You would think that they would be rivals. Why? Well, because King Saul is the king, and typically when the king dies, the son becomes the next king, and that would have been Jonathan. But Jonathan knew and understood that David had been appointed and anointed by God to be the future king, and he didn't see David as his rival. Instead, in the midst of both of them walking through this dysfunctionality amongst their families, they found this common bond, something that they could relate to one another with, and they ended up becoming great, great friends. Now, here's how the Bible talks about it and describes their relationship. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 3, it says this. It says, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And from that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Now, I don't know what kind of covenant they made or pinky promise they made, but the point is is that they had a conversation that was like, look, bro, I got your back. No matter what, I got your back. You got my back. For some strange reason, my dad's trying to kill you, but I'm going to stand up for you. I got your back. And he followed through on that. Jonathan actually stood up for David. There was one point in 1 Samuel 19 where King Saul says he's going to go out and kill David. And Jonathan's like, hold up, dad, chill, man. David's a good guy. David is a stand-up guy. David has done nothing against you. He's only served you as king, protected you, gone to battle for you on your behalf. Why on earth would you want to kill him? And in that time, King Saul actually said, you know what, as long as the Lord lives, I'm not going to kill him. Now, he didn't really live up to that promise because he continued to try and kill David later. But the point is, is that Jonathan had literally taken some specific steps to show and prove that he was a good friend to David. There was a few things that he did. The first is that Jonathan, he cared for David. He cared for him specifically in his needs. And he also, the second thing, he looked out for David's life, for his future, and for his well-being. And lastly, he saw potential in David's life. Now, my question for you tonight is, who are you seeing potential in? Who are you caring for? Who are you looking out for their future and their well-being? See, many times and oftentimes we want people to do that for us, but we seldom make the time to do that for other people. I want to challenge you and encourage you to do that, to be intentional about seeing those around you and finding people in your life who you would call brothers and sisters and really uh, stepping out and caring for them and caring for their future. If we are Jesus followers... You need people who encourage you 
closer in your walk with God. Those are two things that my friends Adam and JR have done. They've called me out in times in my life where I needed to be called out. And they've said, hey, bro, like you really shouldn't have posted that. Or, hey, you really didn't, you shouldn't have said that. I don't understand what's going on or what's happening, but talk to me. Help me out here. Help me understand. We need people like that. And check out what Proverbs 18, 24 says. It's an awesome passage of scripture that really just kind of brings this all together. It says this. It says, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That is what we aspire to be, and that is who we aspire to be. That is what we need. We need friends in our lives who are going to stick closer than a brother. Friends in our lives who are going to fill the gaps that our family leaves behind. This is what God wants for you. It matters to have more people than your family. That's what God can and wants to do for you. He wants to extend your family. He wants to grow your family. He wants you to be part of a bigger family. You see, because the church is not a building, okay? I know it's like, hey, we're going to go to church. We're going to go here. We're going to go to this building. We're going to go to this youth program at this place. But that's not what the church is. The church is people. The church is the body of Christ. You and I are the body of Christ. We are the church. And what that means is we are a family. We are brothers and sisters, and we are there to lift each other up, to carry each other's burdens, to help keep each other accountable, to look out for our future, and to help keep, each, keep us all in check. That is what the purpose of the body of Christ is. Now, check out what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, verses 24 through 25. It says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Listen, church, we do not meet together as church just because it's habit or it's rituals. We meet together as church because it is essential, because I need brothers and sisters in my life, and you need brothers and sisters in your life. You need the extended family of the church to carry you on, to press on forward, and to point you closer to God. And here's the secret, okay? When you have have people in your life, brothers and sisters who are part of the family of Christ, when you have them in your life to fill those gaps and fill those voids in your life that your family leaves behind, they actually will help you relate to your own family even better. They help you better understand and say, man, how did you deal with this when your parents went through a divorce? How did you deal with it when your grandmother passed away? How did you deal with it when you didn't have food on the table and you didn't have a vehicle to get on a ride to get to go anywhere? How did you deal with it when you had to try and save up money for your car insurance and all these things? That's what the family of God is all about. So what do we do from here, okay? Two application things real quick, and then we'll be done. The first is you need to focus on widening your circle. You've got to begin to identify the people in your youth group, the people in your life, the people who God has placed there for a specific purpose. The people who maybe one day they'll be in your wedding, but the people that you can go to and say, hey, how can you help me with this? Can I help you with that? And you can begin to uh, spur one another on to good deeds, as it says in Hebrews 10. Um, and secondly, you got to talk about it. Just like David and Jonathan, they made a covenant. They actually had a conversation at one point that said, look, I'm going to have your back. You have my back. I had those conversations with my brother Adam and my brother JR. And here we are now all these years later, and we've continued to fulfill that covenant between us. Like, look, we're brothers. No matter what happens, we may disagree on things. We may fight from time to time, but we're brothers. We're family, and nothing's ever going to come between that. Maybe you need to do that with your small group. You've been meeting together in your small group for the past six or seven, eight weeks or so maybe, or even longer, and maybe you need to say, hey, guys, let's take this to the next level. Hey, girls, let's really be sisters together. Let's really do this together outside of a Wednesday night or a Tuesday night or whatever night of the week. Let's get together and do life together. Let's spur each other on to good deeds. Imagine if for the next few years of your life you had a group of people outside of your family who you cared for, who you loved for, and who you were intentional with, then you were just like you are your family. It would change your life. It would change your future, and it would make your life at home even better. You know, our brothers Adam and JR, we've been, we've been so close for over 20 years now. 
And I'm so grateful to call them my brothers. And I know that God wants to do that in your life. God can and will extend your family. Be part of the family of Christ. Be part of the youth ministry that God has placed you in. And grow and walk together to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Um, It matters to have more people than just your family in your life. Let me pray for you as we wrap up this series, Family Matters. God, thank you for this series as we learn so much about what it means to have a valuable family and how we can value the family that you have blessed us with. I pray that we each would be intentional to find people in our lives to be brothers and sisters with, that we would do life together with, that we would build community with, and that you would extend our family to have a huge family, God, one that cares and spurs one another on to love and good deeds. Thank you for all that you do all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen.